Welcome to the new intro for episode 107. Better late than never. We were proud to participate in podcast blackout last week, and getting this one to you a little later than normal was worth it. This week, you get to hear all about my hysterectomy, and what a COVID test feels like, and how to increase your food harvest, and who had sex in the snack aisle. Buckle up. In boutique. We may be awful, but, but we're, we're right. So in the last week or so, uh, you and I haven't talked very much because I've been doing a lot of sleeping. Uh-huh. So you haven't gotten to hear what's been going on with me. I mean, you know, you know what's been going on. Yeah. But- so it's this is a this is a good time this is a good time to tell you so um, I've I've mentioned on past episodes that I was going to have a hysterectomy well I have now had it it has now as of today as of like basically right now uh, it's been a week since I had my surgery and uh, it was a bit of an adventure and there was some unexpected aspects to it. And I, I have not, I've saved lots of the really good details because uh, I, I just couldn't wait to get your reaction. To oh, yeah, because you've told me nothing of your thing. You were alive and oh. okay. You know? Yeah, exactly. Because that was the most important part. Yeah. Um, well, I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll say real quick, I'm doing fine. Uh, I'm still really weak. I am putting as much of my body's energy into healing as I possibly can. Mm-hmm. I'm making sure I get plenty of protein and, you know, building blocks so that my body can build itself back together again. But uh, I'm doing a lot of resting and I get tired very quickly. So, but other than that, I mean, my the pain level is almost down to nothing. Oh, good. I have very, very little pain. I stopped taking the stupid Norco a few days ago because the last thing you need when you're recovering from abdominal surgery is, is a drug that makes you constipated. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was basically on a liquid diet for a few days, but then even after that, it was like, Oh my God. I mean, some, some of you out there may have experienced what I call the poo faint where you have to go and it's so bad. And for some reason it's so hard and so large and so somehow jagged or something that it's like the worst pain you can imagine. And you almost faint on the toilet. I, yeah, that happened to me a couple days ago. Oh no. But that was the, un, that was the uncorking of the bottle after a week, a week. Oh well, yeah. Norco does nothing. that. Fucking Norco. Well, and that, I, I don't know them. about you, but Norco, it makes me real irritable too. It just doesn't do, see, I, Back when I was a pill popper, I took massive amounts of hydrocodone, because that's what Norco is. I took massive amounts of hydrocodone for, quote, fun, even though I don't know what it did to me. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I, because I was also taking a bunch of other shit at the same time, but it was just like with part of the handful of pills I would take every day. And so... I don't know if it never did anything for me or if I abused it and now it doesn't do anything for me, but I've never had any luck with hydrocodone actually making pain better. And I beg them not to give me that, but they mm-hmm. they don't want to give out opioids anymore. Oh, yeah, because hydrocodone is like the least of the... Oh, God. Yeah. I mean, they didn't even want to do, like, Tylenol 3. I mean, they didn't want to do... I mean, that works for me, but it also makes me... Where, like, every noise will echo in my head and really piss me off. Oh, God. Oh, so, yeah. It's like, I, can't, yeah, I just I can't it. take it. I just can't. And I was trying to only take it at night, but still, taking it every day, it's like, you know, it, it interferes with your body. But anyway. Anyway. Uh, I wanted morphine. I wanted tramadol. You know, just for a couple days. 
just a couple days. I was going to be sleeping for like 48 solid hours anyway. I don't think I've ever Did... taken morphine. <laughs> oh, I have. The last seven years ago when I had the uterine ablation, they gave me morphine to, to, to take home. I think morphine, I think when you go under general anesthesia, I think morphine is what they give you. I think. Or at least, or at least a combination of that. But anyway, uh, I will back up a little bit. So my surgery was on Wednesday. On Tuesday, I had to go down there in the morning to the hospital to get a series of tests. Uh-huh. Uh, because, well, you know how, like, okay, my, my surgery was originally supposed to be the 1st of April, and then it got bumped to, um, to May 20th. And part of the problem now is that the hospital had to cancel slash postpone all these surgeries. And then when they got to start doing surgeries again, they kind of had to double up. Mm -hmm. So because they have the ones that would normally be scheduled and then they have all the ones they're trying to play catch up on. So God damn it. They're busy. And they are, I mean, every protocol, a lot of people were like, aren't you afraid to go to a hospital right now? with everything going on. And it's like, well, not really because they're being way more careful to protect every patient beyond what a hospital normally would do. I mean, this is, I mean, no one's getting a fucking staph infection. No one's getting, you know, it's like you couldn't possibly get an infection right now because of all the levels. And, and one of the things that I had to do in addition to blood tests and, um, an EKG for a couple minutes and, oh, some other, you know, some other little test was I had to get a COVID test mm-hmm. the day before. Now I got to ask and you when they stick the thing up your nose, does it hurt? I'm not going to say no. I mean, yeah, it does. Cause I have but, such anxiety about ever having to do that. <laughs> I don't know have, if I have can. You ever, have you ever had a flu swab? No. Okay. I will. Now I will say this. I have had both now. Because I ha- I used to have flu swabs all the time because when my mom was sick, um, if I got even the tiniest inkling of what if this is the flu, I went and got a flu test. I mean, the, the clinic near me was getting annoyed that I was coming in for flu tests all the time, but I couldn't fuck around with that because yeah. I could not bring the flu into my parents' house. So I've had a lot of brain-stabbing flu swabs. Now, the, f- the flu test... It's a long, a long wooden swab with a big, you know, Q-tip end, and they go straight up your nose, straight up into your sinuses, oh. and they and they just go up there till they hit brain, oh. and it is, it is horrible. Uh, it is like I I don't even know if I can explain it, but it is horribly, horribly painful. Um, I've had nurses tell me that. It really shouldn't always be that bad, but a lot of nurses don't do it don't do it well, and it's like, well, then they shouldn't be allowed to do it. Yeah, yeah. If there's a way to do it that it doesn't impale me, like skewer my brain, then maybe only the ones who do it well should be allowed to do it because it's horrible. It's a lot to go through to be told you don't have the flu. Yeah, you know. And I've I mean I've done it like I don't know eight ten times, and I've never had the flu any time I've ever had. Oh it. God. But the COVID test, they even did the COVID test uh, as a drive through So even though I was already in the hospital and getting tests done in there, I had to go back to my car, drive around from the north entrance to the west entrance where they were doing the drive through COVID test. And I will say there is something really great about having it done in your car because you're strapped to a chair. Uh. Your head, your head is against a rest, so you don't move your head, and it's a very important thing that you don't move your head uh. because they are being very, very precise where they are putting this tiny thing, and if you move your head, you're gonna probably make it hurt a lot worse because they are aiming for a very specific spot. Mm-hmm. So the the COVID swab is half the thickness of a flu swab. Oh, okay. It is very, and it's a, it's a, a metal, some sort of metal, uh, s- instead of wood uh-huh. and it's slightly flexible. So there's like some give to it. So it's not like stabbing you with a stick and the, and the swab end is extremely tiny. So it, it's very much more of a pinpoint of where it's touching you. Okay. And 
And it's like, they basically, they want you to look straight ahead. Like, they don't, don't tip your head back. Don't do anything. You look, because they are going, instead of going up, like the flu swab, they go straight back. Like, they are trying oh. to hit the very, very back of, like, where your sinuses meet your throat. Uh-huh. Like, that that join back there. Oh. And they are going straight back, and it, and they go really slow, but they have to because they're not trying to punch a hole in you. Yeah. And they go really, really slow, and then when they hit it, the nurse is like, okay, I'm there. I just have to stay there for a few seconds. And she kind of slightly rotates uh-huh. the swab a little bit, like with her fingers. So it's in there, and it's like, Ugh. And then she slowly pulls it out, and then she puts it up your at the same swab, puts it right up your other nostril, and does the same thing on the other side. So it's twice. Oh, no. Mm-mm. So it's twice, and it's staying in there for a minute. But honestly, I was shocked how tolerable it was. But I think it's only because I have worse things to compare it to. I mm-hmm. really think that. Because I could totally see that this is, I mean, if you've never had someone swab your sinuses before, it's unnerving. It's fucking unnerving. And I will say that the pain, it's hard to call it a pain. You know, when you're swimming, especially in like a chlorinated pool, and you get water up your nose, that kind of burning sensation that you get, like at the back of your throat, that's what it feels like. Except it's a pinpoint of that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. And that feeling kind of lingers. It takes it a little while to go away. It only took maybe, it took less than a minute for my eyes to stop watering. And the nurse who did my test, I'm not making this up, she gave me a lollipop. Uh, oh my god! <laughs> she was, she had a lollipops in her pocket, and of course she's only dealing with people who are driving cars. Yeah, so yeah. So she's only giving these tests to adults. But I loved the fact that she gave me a lollipop. And honestly, a lollipop is a good thing to have after that because you're you're creating saliva. You're oh, yeah. swallowing. It actually did kind of help a little bit as I was driving out of there, but. Uh, Oh, God. <laughs> oh, that just sounds horrible, though. I could no. Yeah. The thought of it is making me so, is making me anxious just thinking oh, about it's, it. Oh, it's, I mean, my, my eyes are watering a little bit, just, you know, just going back to it. But I will, but, you know, it, it's, it, it isn't as horrible as I thought it was because, you know, a lot of people, and I'm assuming you've seen the same video I have of, I think it was like a military guy getting the swab and he was like having a seizure almost uh. from, from, and it was just like, okay, well, that guy was never going to be able to handle it. Yeah. Compared to, it's it's just like, look, I mean, it it could just be that I have, I could have my mother's pain threshold. I could have that, where I just can tolerate levels of pain. But then again, if you're a woman who's been having really bad cramps your whole adult life, you can tolerate levels of pain that other people cannot. So anyway, so... Because, oh my God. Yeah, anyway. Because, oh my God. Which which I learned recently uh, that the um, bad menstrual cramps are the same level of squeeze pressure because your uterus is actually squeezing. Uh-huh. Um, it's the same as the second... The second phase of contractions in labor. The part of labor where it's squeezing and you're pushing the baby out. Oh, that, really? That is the exact same level of squeeze pressure that uh, cramps are. Wow. So, you know, and I used to I used to speculate about that. I used to wonder, because being someone who's never had a kid, I used to wonder what the comparison was. And I used to wonder if cramps were, in a way, preparing women for childbirth. Probably. By making yeah. us tolerant of, of certain types of pain. Hi, this is Two Girls on a Bench, the podcast. So we're two writers who tend to procrastinate just a bit. We like to snack. We like to talk. We don't have time to write, but we have time to do this podcast. We certainly do. Join us on the bench. Listen in. At number two, Girls on a Bench. Another thing COVID related.
violated. The policies on whether or not you can have a visitor in your room, that apparently changes week to week, sometimes day to day in hospitals oh, right now. Oh, and when I have an anecdotal thing about that too, just that's really quick, but go on with your story. Yeah. Okay. Because my husband, he... He really wanted to be in the room with me like the whole time. Like he wanted to stay the night in my room with me. And they were like, no, he can't stay the night. And when I got there, well, the day that I had the test, a nurse told me that the week before he wouldn't have been allowed in at all. Like he could take me there in the morning when I did my paperwork. And then when they take me back, he has to leave and he can't come back until he picks me up the next day. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky that he was going to get to come in at all. When, so so he was going to be able to be in the room that first day, and then they'd throw him out when visiting hours are over or whatever, and then he would get to pick me up the next day. Well, the next morning, the rules had changed again, and I was able to call him and tell him, you can come whenever you want, and that way you'll just oh, be here. Oh, good, when they let okay. Because hospitals, I don't, I mean, I had a lot of experience with this with my mom, where you know what day you're getting discharged, but you don't know if that's 11 in the morning or five in the afternoon or eight o'clock at night. You don't know. You know, they discharge you when everything has happened that needs to happen. And those things and it are always not takes scheduled. way longer than you think. <laughs> well, especially since one of the things that has to happen is you have to fart. Did you know that? Yeah. Well, you told me, but yeah, it makes, I, it makes it's sense. It's really now. hard to fart yeah. on command. It's really hard to, when you really want to fart, I mean, I was I was inflating like a balloon. But it was just a matter of waiting for a fart to work its way through. Horrible. But anyway, but that's a whole other thing. But, okay, tell, tell your story and then I'll go back. Oh, no, I was just going to say, like, really briefly, they just reminded me of this thing where, you know, Aunt Josephine mm-hmm. fell out of bed. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it happened at night, of course, in the, in the assisted living, but she's in, like, independent living, so they don't come in as regularly as they do if it was in, like, nursing, right? Right, right. So, but anyway, she ended up being on the floor for hours. Right. Because she couldn't get up and she couldn't reach anything. So anyway, they came in, they found her, and of course they had to send her to the hospital because they didn't know what happened. And if there's any danger of, like, you know, hitting your head, you have to be sent out. Oh, and it yeah, was a, she could have broken any bone. Yeah, yeah, and it was a good thing that she was sent out because she had she broke her arm. Right. But anyway, when she was at the hospital... Her son, no, 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 I take that back. Her daughter, who lives in Washington, is medical POA. Oh, okay. The only, the closest relative she has is her son. And this is her son who lives in the same city. They would not let him in to see his mother because he wasn't POA. Oh, wow. And I'm like, that's, I mean, it's kind of understandable, but it's crazy. It does seem a little weird. And, you know, come to think of it. Yeah, I mean, if it wasn't my husband, if it was, if if my husband was out of town and it had to be, you know, my sister or something, I honestly don't know if it would have been a different role because she wasn't my husband. I don't know. I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah, yeah. Because they did ask on things. They did ask things like that early yeah, on. Yeah, because when mom was telling me about that, I was like, oh my God, did he raise a fuss? Because you've never met my cousin Jimmy, but he's like, yeah. okay, so when... He makes his living for his whole life as a grave digger. And That's fascinating. He's a biker. Wow. And he looks like a tattooed, scary, Hispanic right. biker dude. Yeah. And he has the temper and the drinking and blah, blah, blah that goes along with that. <laughs> so when mom told me this, I was like, oh, my God, did he create a scene? But no, oh he God. did not, thank God. Oh, my God. Oh, God, that's that's, anyway. that's amazing. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> yeah, you've never met Jimmy. You'd probably get a big kick out of him. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I did find out that there was a reason why my periods were so fucking bad. I mean, granted, I knew I had fibroid tumors. Back in January, when I had my appointment, and she immediately felt a fibroid, she went in and did the ultrasound, saw that I had three tumors that totaled about the size of a baseball. And those tumors, there was no evidence of them seven years ago when Mm -hmm. I had had my previous ultrasound. And I had been curious because she was kind of like, wow, these grew kind of really fast. Like she was kind of surprised that they were the size they were at that amount of time. So I had been curious 
how, you know, because all these months had gone by and an additional month and a half had gone by since my original surgery date, like how much, like what size the fibroid might have been, like had it grown again. Okay, so so anyway, so I go in for my surgery. Uh, what, one thing I'll say, I, I, my surgery uh, was done in part by robots. Ooh, I had, that's kind of fab. I had what is known as a da Vinci laparoscopic hysterectomy, which I, I discovered this morning. If you, if you look that up on YouTube, you can actually watch one of those surgeries being done. I mean, like all the blood and guts and everything, if you want. Or there's also other surger, other videos that'll just kind of show you techniques and explain it, but you can actually watch one of those if you want. I have not done that yet. I, My I morbidity wants me to watch it, though. <laughs> I know there's a, there's a part of me that wants to watch it. There's a part of me that wants to watch mine, and that's that. And for that reason, so, um, because what what I found out afterwards was that um, I was told that I would have like like maybe four little incisions, and mm-hmm. that they were going to pull everything out my vagina. You know, they were going to cut cut everything loose, pull it out the vagina, sew sew me back up. And that because they were using the robots, uh, which are basically like long little skinny sticks. Wow, so it's probably like really teeny and precise, huh? My my incisions, uh, my little incisions are all like, like, like my finger, like just big enough for my finger to fit in. And there's four of those, two on each side. But then they had to cut my belly button apart. And there's like... Two inches wide, my belly button. I, I have no idea because that's a big bandage. Oh, yeah, and, yeah. And God, your belly button is right, literally right in the middle of everything. And every time you move, you feel your belly button. That's really the only pain that I have to deal with. And it's it's slight, but it, it, it just reminds me that it's there. That's basically all it's doing at this point. But at first it was like, oh my God. Well, what happened was, the reason why they had to cut open my belly button is because my uterus was considerably larger than it was supposed to be. Hmm. Now, I specifically remember when I was a kid doing, you know, the family life education, as they used to call it in grade school. And when you're learning your basic, you know, girl and boy anatomy, when they talk about your uterus, they say that your uterus is about the size of your fist. Yeah, yeah, that's what I remember. Well, my uterus was four times the size it was supposed to be. Wow. And on top of that, it had tumors. So what got pulled out of me, what needed to be removed from me was not only, now remember before she was like, okay, you have a fibroid the size of a baseball. Uh Now I have a mass in me that needs to come out that's like a small cantaloupe, maybe? Wow. And it's hard as a fucking rock. And 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 it could they would not be able to pull it out my vagina because Uh because basic anatomy. I mean it's like, well, you know, like let's just pretend that was a baby. The baby can't come out of the vagina until the woman's pelvis se- separates and hinges and and comes apart and then yeah, yeah. and then the hole's big enough for the baby to come out and then the pelvis goes back together again. So since I wasn't in labor, not that was not coming out my vagina. There was no way. Yeah. So that's why they had to cut into my belly button. They had to cut my uterus and my tumors into chunks. Oh, wow. And pull, they had like this netting that they put in there to kind of catch everything as they cut it apart. And then they pulled it out piece by piece. So it took a little longer than they thought it would. Oh, my God. The robots got a got a big job, a big construction job <laughs> or a demolition job, I guess I should say. And um, yeah, so my belly button kind of hurts. But uh, and th- that also means that that giant mass then now there was a space in my lower abdomen 
Uh that big. So for several days after that, I started becoming kind of aware of my internal organs shifting a little bit because they have to move around. Oh, yeah. And I realized that my lower tummy pooch, the the belly button to crotch pooch that I had, um, that was all uterus and tumor. I mean, it's not like my stomach is ever going to be flat, but that bit that has always felt kind of hard Uh and has always been... You know, my God. I mean, how is there room for my bladder in there? How is there room for anything? It's astonishing. But now that that's gone, I'm just thinking pink spandex pedal pushers. You know, that they can ride a little higher and fit a little better. That's what I'm thinking. Because you'll have a little more room fit the waist. Well, I, I'm still fat. Nah, I'm you're still voluptuous. And fat. <laughs> you're a voluptuous bird of paradise. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also still I'm also still quite round. But but <laughs> as the swelling is going down, my my lower abdomen seems a little a little flatter than it used to be, but it's never gonna be flat because it's never been yeah, flat yeah. a day in my life. Breathe deeply, deeply the year of woo. In this episode's Woo, we will discuss sacrifices and practices to ensure a bountiful crop. Although these things are largely unpracticed now, at least in first world countries, there is a long history of, to our modern view, unsavory things that were done to appease the gods to make sure that they provided needed food harvests. Many of these were very bleak indeed. In ancient India, human sacrifice was a common practice to appease the gods for food. And in fact, there have been outbreaks in recent years of finding corpses of undesirables in very rural areas. And evidence points to these poor souls being sacrificed in the belief that they would help produce food. Somewhat less disturbing is an ancient practice in Hapao in the Philippines involving an elaborate ritual of sacrificing four chickens and reading their innards for good omen signs regarding an upcoming harvest. If the omens are positive, then a pig is also slaughtered. The pig is then danced around exactly nine times, hopefully assuring a bountiful harvest ahead. This is still practiced to this day. Even Thor was given his due in times of famine, when his aid was needed to turn the tide of a bad year. Animals were actually hung in a sacred grove in sacrifice for a replenishment of food. The world's cultures are ripe with sacrificial traditions of this nature. All over our planet, similar things were done for generations as society struggled for food. Fortunately, most of these practices are long gone. But a few still remain. A Cherokee ritual for corn is still practiced. A deer tongue is sacrificed in fire, then eaten, and kernels of corn are burned. A group of kernels taken from a separate ear to represent each clan in the Cherokee nation. This is much more sedate and reasonable from our points of view. This even seems poignant to me and something I would have no trouble doing. But the most fabulous thing that I've come across regarding crop rituals just happened in 2009. And this delights me to my core and is wooer than woo. I have no idea how I've never heard of this before, and I cannot tell it any better, so I will read the story from metro.co.uk website. And oh my god, I love this. Are you ready? A cult leader in Papua New Guinea fled naked into the jungle after being confronted by police over allegations that he'd forced followers to have sex in public with the promise that it would boost the banana harvest. (laughs) The man, identified as Thomas Peely, told his followers that the banana harvest would increase every time they had sex in public, and he reinforced his demands for public fornication with threats of violence. This enforced public sex has been going on for three or four months, according to witnesses. Several times, naked people have been seen trying to enter a nearby mining area, but have been stopped because of policy against allowing naked people to walk around the mine. Okay, 
When three police officers contacted Peely at his house, the cult leader emerged naked and fled into the bush with seven of his followers, using two of his wives as human shields when the police fired warning shots. So yeah, public sex for bananas. And as far as I know, our good Raven Peely has never been heard from since. Hey, you guys. We know a lot of you listen to us on your commute or all sneaky with earbuds in the office, and your schedule is crazy and upside down right now. But the thing is, you're still listening. We see you. You're all still out there sticking with us, and we love you so much for that. And I hate to ruin this lovey-dovey moment with business, but I bet you've all got friends who got all the way to the end of Netflix, and they're starting to whine about how bored they are. So could you maybe suggest us as an alternative to utter ennui? I mean, imagine how much more you'll enjoy talking to them when they finally understand your Verity Noslin references. Spread the word about Penny and Amelia, and we'll spread... I don't know. Something. Okay. Love ya. Mean it. I will I will say that my first hospital stay ever, uh, I had some badass nurses. Two in particular. Irvin, the, the Hispanic queenie nurse. Love him who even, he was the one who put together my discharge packet and I didn't even notice till I got home when I took it out to look at it again that he had put a little get well card in there. Oh, see, that's awesome because you're fabulous. Irvin was so, he was so cute and he was so funny. And he was the one who told me when he was kind of going over, okay, don't do this, don't do that. You know, you might feel compelled to take a bath. Don't take a bath. And I'm like, oh, I couldn't take a bath if I want to because I don't have the strength to get in and out of my stupid bathtub. But he said that he had a patient once who had this surgery. And after a few days, she felt so much better that she's like, I'm going to go to the lake. And she got, she submerged herself swimming in the fucking lake, lake water, (laughs) lake water, which I don't go in anyway. I might dangle my feet in, but I don't go in the lake because it's gross. It's like fish pee and stuff all it takes she ended up with a massive abdominal cavity infection because all it takes is a pinpoint oh my god that's so crazy in the stitches at the top of your vagina because now my vagina is like the finger of a glove because there's nothing it just comes to an end and it stops and it's been stitched up right there and All it takes is a tiny little opening and the pressure of being in water, because that's a pressure, that's different than air pressure. She basically created a fountain of lake water inside her abdomen and made herself so fucking sick. And I'm like, dude, I'm not stupid. I'm like, like, no, no, no. I said, no, 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 nothing is getting me. No, I I will do everything you tell me. No way. I I wouldn't have done that anyway, but ugh, Yeah. But I'm smart enough to at least consider that I know what they did. I know how stitches work. I know how, you know. And I, I hardly ever actually have stitches. I mostly have the Dermabond stuff, mm-hmm. the glue. And basically, I just leave it all alone, and it will all fall off. It'll all fall off. Oh, I was just going to show in the stitches, too. Are they dissolvable, or they're, do they have to remove the stitches? They're dissolvable. I really oh, don't know what's going on on my belly button because... They have whatever whatever reconstruction they did under there. There's like a big cottony gauze pad thing. And then there's this big plastic adhesive sheet with like a little window in the front so I can see uh-huh. the gauze. And I guess they did it with a window so you could see if it was bleeding and it never bled. But that adhesive is not going anywhere. And when, when that thing comes off on its own that will be enough time for that to heal. So I don't know what my belly, but I, I've always had a really cute belly button and I'm a little concerned that my belly button might not be as cute. Oh no. My husband well, says I shouldn't worry, but it's like, but my, but my belly button is one of the cutest parts of me, but we'll just see. But, uh, yeah, I think that's probably all the, all the high points. My husband's taking very good care of me. Well, of course he's, um, 
he's he's making all my meals and he's making sure that uh, that I don't have to. Well, I mean, I I have to get up and walk around because of blood clots and whatever. But yeah. from the first day, I didn't even have to worry about that. You know, getting off and on the toilet's a little hard sometimes. But I have my I have one of my mom's old walkers in the bathroom with me now to be a handle that I can grab onto. When oh, I need it. that's good. I've taken a couple showers. Oh, oh, that was another thing about the infection. So, have you ever heard of Hibby Cleanse? Uh uh-uh. uh. It is an antimicrobial soap. It is a total hospital level soap, but you can buy it on Amazon. And we had it, we had a big bottle of it years ago when my husband had this cyst on his back that had to be cut out. And then he ended up, when it was healing, he got a staph infection. Oh, I remember that. Oh, and I remember that. That horrible thing in the middle of his back. That that thing in the middle of his back that I got to deal with. It was basically like the world's most enormous zit. It was a big hole. It was a big, pus-filled, infection-laden hole that I had to clean out daily. I, I mean, oh God. I mean, I have had. I am. There's a one of the reasons why I don't have children is I don't do well with fluids. I'm not a fan of fluids. <laughs> Other people's fluids are gross. And I have had disgusting staph infection goo <laughs> spray at me through like what is basically a giant zit on my husband's back. Um, I have, I have, I do we, remember that. <laughs> and we had bought a big <laughs> bottle of that stuff because he needed to, at the very least, at least his back. He needed to wash his back with this stuff because his back needed to be utterly bacteria free, you know, bacteria, virus, everything. And so we were kind of familiar with it. And I had actually bought a couple little bottles of it when the COVID thing started because I thought it would, might be a handy thing to have around. Yeah. You know, if one of us did get sick, we might need that level of soap, you know. But I was given at the hospital before my surgery... I was given a big pump bottle of this stuff. And this shit's expensive, but this is good shit. So basically, I had to take a thorough shower, neck down, clean my entire body with this antimicrobial soap. You put it all over you. You stand there without water on you for three minutes. The soap stays on you for three minutes. Wow. And then you rinse it off. And then you have to... You have to Any clothes you put on have to be freshly laundered. Any sheets, your towels, clothes, sheets have to be freshly laundered so that nothing that touches you has any dirt on it. And then in the morning, this is like, this is the night before surgery. Then in the morning, before you go to the hospital, you take another shower and do the exact same thing. So it's like you're getting flea dipped. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I've i never been cleaner in my life. And this stuff is so powerful that there's warnings all over it. Do not wash your face with it. Because, like, you could make yourself go blind. This soap is so wow. strong. Wow. Like, don't put it on your face. Even if you use a washcloth with it, don't later use that washcloth on your face. Wow. Until it's been laundered. Now, granted, this is the first time I've ever had surgery, but I've never, my dad didn't have to go through this when he had a gallbladder thing, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I've, I've never, I've never heard of this before. And so maybe it's different now because of that. All the new protocols. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely incredible how, I mean, and every nurse that comes into your room has a mask on. I mean, you don't know, you don't, I don't know what any of my nurses look like. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have so many South Asian women, like Durga, the night nurse, who was the other one that was fantastic. I mean, I talked to her a million times, but I only know what her eyes look like. I have, you know, they all have long black hair and a ponytail. They're all wearing scrubs. They're all have a mask (laughs) on. If, unless their eyes are significantly different, I cannot tell them apart. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it was a little unnerving because I don't, Because, you know, if I was one of those people that wasn't used to seeing Asian people my whole life, I might think they all look alike, and they don't look alike, and that's the whole point. But God God damn it, all these nurses were identical. That's so funny. (laughs) Because I couldn't actually see them. And half the time, they were were in semi-dark anyway, because I kept that room as dark as I could. 
but I slept well because Durga took such good care of me. Good. And uh, I, you know, St. David's North, man, that's a good hospital. Uh, that's the first time I really had a, a, a long-term experience up there, and that, that place rocks. Those people are awesome. So Yeah, and your husband texted me and kept me appraised of every step of your recovery and everything. So Oh, did he? I oh, knew everything nice. that was going on. <laughs> Well, one thing, I think text messaging makes it kind of a lot easier for them to keep people posted because apparently they were texting him throughout. Oh, like, that's good. Like they were, they were, I mean, not like, okay, we've made the incision. I mean, they weren't doing yeah, it at that yeah. level, but he would get, he would get a text like maybe every 30, 40 minutes. Letting oh, him that's know, good. Letting him know that, you know, like as soon as I'm being wheeled out of the OR, Oh God, that was another thing. But like I was talking about how crowded they were and how, how piled on top of the people. When I was in the recovery room, like the post-op, I could, when I was first waking up, I could tell immediately, oh my God, this room is packed. Mm-hmm. Like they couldn't put, fit any more people in there. And all I could hear was all these nurses and doctors running around talking about how people were finishing up their surgeries but they couldn't bring them into post-op because there were no more spaces. And the reason why there was no more spaces is because the rooms that we were all going to go to weren't ready. It was a complete clusterfuck. Oh, and wow. these poor people oh, were Oh, because so they were strict. catching up because of all the backlog surgeries. Right. Huh? Because, yeah, yeah. He, told, he told me there was like on our floor... On the floor where where I did my surgery, there were like a dozen operating rooms, and they were all in constant use that mm-hmm. morning. And that's not even the only floor doing surgeries. So, because this is like, I guess it's gastric, cardiology, and women area, like lady bits. Yeah, I guess that, yeah. I guess I guess that was all that that level, but. It was like there were people who were coming out of anesthesia, being brought out of anesthesia in the operating room where they did their surgery because it was time to bring them out, but they didn't have anywhere to take them. So they just woke them up in the operating room wow. and just had to tell them, we'll move you when we can, but there isn't a place for you yet. Yeah. Crazy. And they're like, hi, look up at these giant lights and mirrors or whatever. Oh my know? God. Yeah. When I rolled into that operating room, the first thing I thought was this room is really fucking big. I, I mean, I've gone into like little procedure rooms before, Yeah. but I'd never had surgery and, and especially because there's robots. And so uh, like the surgeon was going to be way over there working little things so that the robots can come in. You know, it's like, Big, huge, bright room, and the other, the only other thing I can remember about it, big room, lots of people, and um, the song that was playing on the speakers was um, "Fascination" by Human League. Ah, oh my god! I just remember making a little mental note, like, "Oh, cool!" <laughs> it's like these people are obviously <laughs> all my age. <laughs> it's like I like, I like this little little Human League action. I didn't even get to count backwards or anything. I mean, she just sort of said. Okay, we're gonna, and I don't remember anything after that. Oh yeah, I remember they make you count, and I don't think I've ever made it past like the first three. Yeah, I've never well, gotten I mean, past whole, I've only been put under twice, but I remember. Yeah, I had. Well, I've had two, two, lady bits, uh, bablasions, and I got to ninety nine on both of those. I had uh, oral surgery. I got to like ninety nine, ninety eight. This time, she didn't even have me count. She was probably about to tell me to count, but I was already out. I was I was so ready to go night night. I was just like, just do this, just just go. <laughs> yeah, so the only times I've been put under was wisdom teeth, oh. and then the time where I had to have rectal surgery. Yes, which oh, I yes. highly do not recommend. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, that's probably not something we should go into now. But someday, oh, maybe. absolutely not. But it, yeah. I highly not recommend it. <laughs> we can we can compare we can compare the. The ablation, the first ablation that I had compared to the ablation that you had, that we had for similar reasons. Yeah. Just on different parts. Oh my God. Oh yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. Although the difference is I took a train from San Jose to Austin, Texas. Right. Like five days after that surgery. Oh my God. 
And I, that was not a good idea. No, <laughs> That's God, all I will say the, about that right now. <laughs> the sitting on it. Yeah. Cause like, I, I mean, I had to go, you know, I had to go to work and I had like a sit down job. And I, re- I remember the fact that I was sitting on basically raw skin with painkillers that didn't work. And it was just, my attitude was, this is what I get. This is my punishment, you know, because I yeah. was, I was very, very, uh, I was sort of uh, self-punishing to the point of almost flagellation in those days. That, you know, my, my attitude towards any time something went wrong is, well, I deserved it because I was fucked up. <laughs> I was really fucked up. <laughs> oh, anyway. Well, join the Gen X club, girl. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. We all, we all take everything very personally. So that's, uh, yeah, so no, no more uterus. I'm, I'm, in the, uh, I'm in the no uterus club now. Which is awesome, and yes, which uh, also means you're in the no period club. Hello, oh, fabulous. and I I got to have one more horrible, horrible, hemorrhaging, serious pain period days before the procedure. It but ended never, Monday. It it yep, it was Thursday never to Monday. Again. Never again. I don't even know what to do with myself. I don't know what to do with this, these all these boxes of giant tampons and shit that I still have. But I'm gonna donate them somewhere. But yeah, and uh, I I get to uh, I get to hopefully in six to eight weeks I get to I get to see what sex without a uterus feels like. Ooh, and, I, and I really yeah. I didn't think I was gonna be one of those people that's like when can I do it? I didn't I really didn't think I was gonna be that. But like. I was pretty much immediately going, so when can I do it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, that's good. And yeah. I probably think that's probably the most common question. You know? Yeah. And I, you know, I have Googled quite a bit. So apparently I, I can, um, not yet because it's only been a week, but um, maybe in a few weeks I can try some things out myself. I, you know, nothing can go in there, but I can... Yeah, yeah. I can, I can, ex- I can do some exploration a little bit. We'll if you're see. gonna want to, <laughs> I think so. I'm, fas- I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated by what's gonna feel different. But well, you'll find out. Yay! But yay! Yay, hysterectomy. <laughs> Bitchin' Boutique. Yes. Um, I think we need to give them a thing, Spike. We can give them a drop that they can plan out their yes. shows. Yes, I think we've uh, got to find some time and get, get time to do it. I think we do, do it that. right now. I think we should do it right now. Look, I'll show you how easy it is, Spike. <laughs> Watch this. I'm just going to do it live. Okay, do it live. Like that bloke screams. I'm just going to do it live. Watch this. Hi, this is Dr. Dan from the Two Skeptical... Sh- Blah, I can't do it now. <laughs> Look, I can't speak. Too much pressure. Right, I'll try again. I'll try again. I'll try again. Take 52. Hi, this is Dr. Dan from the Two Skeptical Chaps podcast, and you are listening to the most bitchin' boutique. See? That was easy, wasn't it? Okay. They could send us one, we could play it in ass. Yeah, yeah. Right, you do it. Yeah. Right, What do you want me to say? Whatever whatever comes to mind. Hi, this is Spike from the Two Skeptical Chaps podcast, who ain't no bitch, but you're listening to the bitchin' boutique. Oh, that was good. I think, I hope they use that. Let's see if they cut it and put it in the next (laughs) show. Diplomatic community. Okay, so you know how, like, sometimes you're searching on Google for something, Mm -hmm. and you find something completely unrelated. I love that. That's just really fucking weird. I love that. I love that. That's how we find most of our good shit, is accidentally. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I was, because you know, I'm so celebrity, I'm so fascinated with celebrity finances. Yes. Because you know, one of my big things is I want bank statements. Yes, of course. Because <laughs> I want to know, like, I need to know every penny that Ace Fraley ever had and lost, you know. Yeah. How much money did you make? How much did you snort? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But anyway, so I was reading all about Wayne Newton's bankruptcies. Oh, yes. Property sales and blah, blah, blah. And I was reading all about the scandal about how, you know, he had to sell an estate. Did he have to Did he have to sell his Arabian horse, Aramis? Oh, the horses are long oh, gone. Yeah. He loved that horse. Yes, he did. <laughs> Why do I know the whole- name of his horse? 
Well, because there's a whole a whole chapter, chapter in, that book. in his yeah. book about him crying over that horse. Because you know he's such a manly man, he never cried the other horse. than over that horse. Right. And if I remember right, the that biography was called Once Before I Go, yes? Yeah, it yep. sure was. Yes, it was. And yeah, I have two fine. copies of it, one in hardback and one in paper. Well, as, <laughs> as well you should. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, oh, but it was interesting. So anyway, he had to sell his estate, and the people that bought it, for some reason, they thought that all his personal possessions were also included in the sale. Including, like, you know, gold records, awards, family pictures. That's They weren't weird. giving him back any of this stuff, and there was a court case, which Wayne won. But anyway. That's weird, because unless it specifically says that you get every all the contents of mm-hmm. the house, there's no fucking way that that's part of any real estate deal. Oh, that's horse shit. Yeah. But anyway, so I was reading all about that. Do you and think that? Do you think they 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 bought the estate because they wanted they wanted to uh, see all of his girdles, his girdles uh, maybe, and toupees? Because oh my god, you know him and Shatner have a you know have a <laughs> you know a monopoly on the market. <laughs> oh yes, of the uh, of the myrtle, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, somehow that led me to an article, uh, which I have right here. Oh. That was just called Sex in the Snack Aisle. Oh. And of course, okay. I had to click on it. Yeah, so it's called Sex in the oh Snack God. Aisle. Milwaukee gas station faces possible closure over porn video. <gasps> oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah, so what it was is there is this guy who is trying to become a rap star. Of course. So, I'm trying to find his name. Blah, 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 blah. So, oh, anyway. So, to fund his... His first album or whatever. Yes. Convicted felon Frederick Allen... Okay. ...turned the gas station into a porn set while the business was open. Oh, my God. And apparently Frederick Allen is a big star on, is it Pornhub? Is it you porn? It doesn't even matter. Ex hamster. Not that we would know anything about porn. But his thing is him going around Milwaukee having sex in public places. Do we know what you know, his, like, porn name is? Does he have, like, a... Does He, he have, doesn't say. I, I know. Um, I don't know. So we... Well... Because, you know, some people might want to look him up. <laughs> anyway, so his thing is, in Milwaukee, he does all these porn videos in public, right? Right. And apparently, a neighbor that lives behind this particular gas station <laughs> saw the video, hello. Oh, just, just happened to see it. Was like, I recognize that gas station. That's my gas station right by my neighborhood. And I <gasps> want it closed down. And oh, like because so, it's a health hazard or something? Yeah, so he calls <gasps> the sheriff. And it was going on and on. And this is a quote. His name is Clifton Daly, who alerted the authorities. <laughs> oh, God. He had nothing on but a bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it says the video shows Alan, an aspiring rapper and amateur porn model, having sex in the center aisle. And the city alderman, Rainey, (laughs) during his testimony in court, said, and I quote, Keep in mind. (laughs) (laughs) I'm bracing myself. (laughs) Keep in mind. It was right next to the chips and across from the sunflower seeds. <laughs> oh my god. I'm so glad it no longer hurts to laugh. Because, I know. God and then damn it says, it. you know, Alan oh. is known among his online fans for explicit acts in public places. Oh. From shopping malls to movie theaters, public streets, even public parks. This is something they do all across the city, Rainey said. Oh, my God. 
Wait, what city is this? Milwaukee. Milwaukee. We have yeah. some listeners in Milwaukee, I believe. Yes, yes. And then I it goes hear- on. Alan, oh who lives a few blocks from the gas station, says he makes upwards of $10,000 a month. Uh-huh. It's like a business, he said, referencing these porn videos. Right. I do not think that's true. Maybe a thousand. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. how. I mean, he would have to generate massive amounts of income for Pornhub or whatever in order for them to pay him. That uh, yeah, but it's so funny. But then, so anyway, and then the, the, the other kind of fabulous thing about it was, so the oh. owner was saying like, well, I only allow this because, you know, he threatened to kill me if I didn't allow him to film the porn video in the sunflower seed aisle. Oh, right? so he yo, so the owner definitely knew this was happening. Yeah. Okay. And the funny thing is in the video, which I've seen a clip of the video that's oh not the sex, but a clip of the video, oh you can God. see the owner who is supposedly threatened watching behind a big plexiglass thing that convenience stores have. Oh, like so the bulletproof the fuck, glass thing? Yeah, so who the fuck cares if he was threatened by a gun? Oh my that god. That proves that that wasn't true right oh then and there. Oh my god. How. Oh my god. Wow. You know, and the, but then he says, and then, and so the, anyway, the porn star told that supposedly, if you're going to call the police, I will shoot you and burn your gas station too. <sighs> Nobody's going to say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean. Good lord. I mean, all it takes is just get kind of a skeezy guy who owns a gas station. It's like, oh, I get to watch some people fuck? Okay. I mean, it's like... And I I mean, because that way, I guess he would have the option of locking the door so that no one could walk in, I guess. Yeah, but oh my god, Uh, it's so fucking funny, but that whole thing about the sunflower seeds, it just made me laugh. Oh my god, right across from the sunflower seeds. (laughs) You know, and it Can you imagine that? I uh, know it reminded me of that. Would you remember the opening scene of Polyester? Oh my God! Where all the protesters are outside Francine and Elmer Fishpaw's house <laughs> because they are picketing the existence of the porn theater. Right. And they have this old woman who looks just like Verity Noslin's mother. Oh my God! They interview her, and she's like, "Well, his theater just caters to sex offenders." <laughs> and, and that's what the sunflower seed quote reminded me. Of. <laughs> oh, I could, I could definitely, I could hear Verity Noslin if she was recounting, like if she found out that this was happening in a gas station near her home. I could, I could imagine her saying it was right across from the sunflower seeds. Oh, I know. Or I'll never be able to buy the five for a dollar mac and cheese again because sex happened in front of it. <laughs> exactly. Oh my God, that's amazing. But so, I thought that was fabulous. So, do we know? Do we know if that gas station ended up getting shut down for it being a health hazard, or did they just have to clean up that aisle? Let's see. So, this the committee voted not to renew the gas station's license at all. So, Cool Petroleum, the company that owns the gas station, sued the city. Wow. A Milwaukee County judge issued a temporary injunction allowing the gas the gas station to remain open, but the case is still pending. <gasps> Fascinating. Oh, my God. And Alderman Rainey says, to see this gas station still open in operation, it's disturbing. Well, it just makes me want to go to Milwaukee and find this gas station and have my picture taken next to the sunflower seeds. And you know that would, like, totally, the the infamy of this, you bet that gas station sales are, like, 900% more than they were before. (laughs) Totally. I would go in there just to do that. Oh, my God. And I would totally buy stuff. Yeah, so anyway, I thought that was pretty fabulous. That is amazing. And and how fascinating that you found that on a search about Wayne Newton's bankruptcy. Like, I wonder what the connection is there. I don't know, but... <laughs> oh, but in closing, I will say this, but one of the last lines of the article, uh-huh. which I didn't remember, Alan, 
has more than 67,000 subscribers on Pornhub. His videos on that site alone have more than 100 million views. All right, we're going to have So maybe he does make a shit ton of money. Maybe. God, I'm in the wrong business. Yeah, you should... Yeah. (laughs) If I was 30 years younger in the internet age, you never know. I know, right? I mean, imagine (laughs) imagine if, if the internet had been around in like the, you know, the... Well, the internet was technically around in the early 90s, but imagine if it was this level. Oh, know. I know. Well, you know, I did have my, you know, my brief little moments of fame with my little webcam, but... Oh, my God. That was a long fucking time ago, and I would never in a million years do that again. <laughs> and it wasn't for... It wasn't for audiences, though. It no, was for it was just yeah, you know. But oh god, God, if it was if it, if I was that age now, who knows? All right, who wants to see me fuck a pumpkin? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. If you enjoy our show, please take a moment to rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. If you send us a screenshot of your review, we'll send you a Bitchin' Boutique sticker. Everyone Everyone loves loves stickers! Please subscribe or add us to your favorites wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribers get new episodes first and are also more attractive. Drop us a line anytime at pitneyandamelia at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Keep in mind... It was right next to the chips and across from the sunflower seeds. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>